Morning, Dr. Galea. Good morning. Uh, can you, you can see me, can you? I can, yep. And you can hear me, obviously. Um, and you, you are, I, I think, uh, an hour ahead of us where you are, are you? That's correct. Uh, so uh, when we take breaks, which we will do during the day, I, I'm afraid they will correspond with our coffee breaks and our lunch breaks, uh, and I hope you're happy to put up with that. <coughs> no problem. Now, in a moment or two, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Oliver to uh, administer the, uh, the oath that you're affirming, I think. Uh, you're talking to an audience here in uh, uh, Aldwych House in central London. Uh, you're talking to a, a small audience in the uh, auditorium, a number of lawyers, uh, a number of participants. Uh, beyond this room, however, you're talking to roughly 100 or, or so people, that, that is what I expect the audience will be today, uh, who will be watching uh, online uh, as your evidence is streamed. So that's who you're talking to. Now, are you there on your own? Yes. Uh, very well. Well, Miss Scott will ask you questions in a moment or two once you have been sworn. Oliver, please. Please state your full name. George Galea. Thank you. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Galea, can you see and hear me? I can, yes. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of your career, career and then go on to look at some of the um, committees and groups um, that you uh, participated in. So um, you were between 1980 and 1984 a lecturer in haematology at, at the Aberdeen University, is that right? Yeah. And then in 1984 you took up a post as a senior registrar at the Aberdeen and North East Scotland Blood Transfusion Service a post you held until 1989. Correct. Uh, and the director at that time was uh, Dr. Abaniak, is that correct? Yep. Uh, uh, and we're going to be hearing um, uh, from him I in January. Uh, and then from uh, 1989 to 1993, you remained at the um, Aberdeen uh, Blood Transfusion Service, but you were uh, at that time a consultant, is that correct? Um, and uh, between 1993 and 1996, you were the director of the Inverness and North Scotland Blood Transfusion Service. Yes. Uh, and uh, between 1996 and 1999, you were the director of the Dundee and East Scotland Blood Transfusion Service. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, and then in 1999, you took up a national uh, post um, as the National Tissue and Cells Director uh, based in Edinburgh, which was a post you held until 2013. That's right. Uh, and then from 2014, you have been um, acting as a consultant to the Maltese government, which is a post you um, c continue in today. That's right. Uh, and your statement tells us that you've never given evidence in any previous inquiry or any um, uh, previous litigation concerned with the issues that this inquiry is looking into. Is that correct? No, that's right. I haven't. Turning then to the working groups and committees, um, is it right to understand that you had a, a post as, a, as the medical advisor to the blood collection programme, which is a, a post within the um, SNBTS? That's right. Uh, and you uh, describe in your witness statement that that um, uh, role um, was uh, to recommend changes and to update donor medical issues and harmonise donor matters throughout this, the, the SNBTS. That was the main aim, yes. Uh, and we'll look, and at some of, we'll look at some of the work that you did in that role um, uh, as we go through the morning. Uh, and in that role, you provided regular reports to the Medical and Scientific Committee of the SMBTS, of which you were not at that stage a member, 
uh, but you did attend parts of their meetings when those reports were discussed so that you could report upon them. Is that right? That's right, yep. Uh, you were um, also, and you, you tell us this was an extension of your role as the medical advisor to the blood collection programme, you were also the chair and member of the Scottish Donor Consultants Group. Is that, is that right? Yes. Uh, uh, and um, uh, that, in that role, you made recommendations to the Medical and Scientific Committee of the SNBTS for approval, uh, and you ensured that, um, uh, that, all, that there was consensus approval for any recommendations from the other donor consultants who you met with within that group. That's right. Uh, and so that was really, is this right to understand, that was a forum in which consultants around Scotland could meet and share best, best practice and then report on to the Medical and Scientific Committee? In the context of donor matters, yeah. Um, then from 1993, when you became a director of the Inverness Centre and, uh, and equally when you were a director from 1996 of the Dundee Centre, you became a member of the Medical and Scientific Committee of the um, SNBTS. Yeah. Uh, uh, and if we can just look um, at uh, um, a document, just to um, ha have a look at ha how the, 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 um, that worked, it's SBTS 40456 underscore 027. So on the first page of this, we've got a structure. Um, and so there we have there the, the chairman is the National Medical and Scientific Director um, and the secretary and product, is product services manager. And then the members are, are, of the committee are the five directors of the regional transfusion centres, the director of PFC, the director of NSL, and then also the director of the Belfast um, uh, um, Regional Transfusion Centre. And then in attendance is an observer from the um, English NBTS representative who is non-voting, and then product services assistant and assistant secretary also non-voting. Is that, is that how you recall the um, committee to have operated in your time? Um, I think it did change a bit. Um, I think the secretary, um, was in the National Operations Manager, uh, Martin Bruce, uh, for a long time as part of the, uh, the Medical and Scientific Committee. Um, in my time, I wasn't aware that the National Director of Belfast was a full member of the group. I knew that he, um, he used to attend quite often. Uh, I have occasionally, but very rarely, seen an NBTS representative from the English Blood Service. Um, and the Product Services Assistant, I'm not quite sure that that, um, I cannot recall who that person was actually. And then if we turn over to page four of this document, we can see the remit of the committee. Um, MSC was set up by SNBTS board with the remit to advise the board on matters of medical and scientific policy. This is achieved by making recommendations on issues which affect donor safety um, and which affect patient safety, overseeing donor education activities, implementing and maintaining an effective programme of medical audit, implementing and maintaining an effective quality assurance programme within the SNBTS ensuring scientific work performed within and on behalf of the SNBTS is of an appropriate professional standard and appropriately monitored, ensuring the board is kept up to date with scientific developments, ensuring maintenance of supply of appropriate diagnostic reagents to the NHS in Scotland, um, ensuring microbiological screening of SNBTS donations conforms to UK standards, and ensuring that SNBTS products conform to appropriate modern standards. Um, and then it says to assist in the performance of the above, the MSC will, re will receive regular reports from, and we can see there you are met there noted as the medical advisor to the blood collection program. So can we date this document sometime between 1989 and, uh, and uh, 1993? So between the time when you became a consultant in Aberdeen um, and before you took up your post as director in Inverness. That's probably fair, yeah, I think so. And then we can see um, other um, uh, members, uh, uh, other people there set out 
and that also provide regular reports to um, the uh, to the um, uh, MSC, the Medical and Scientific Committee. And if we go over the page, uh, that list continues, including director of PFC, IT managers, quality assurance coordinators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, turning then to um, you were also uh, is this right from from the uh, by dint of your directorship of uh, both in Inverness and Dundee you were also a member of the board of the um, um, Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service uh, and um, the function of the board was to discuss management and financial matters and to make decisions about uh, those matters for the SNBTS yeah that's correct uh, you were, uh, between 1991 and 2000, a member of the UK Blood Transfusion Service Standing Advisory Committee on Donor Care and Selection. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the purpose of that committee was to ma maintain appropriate specifications on the care and selection of donors, was it? Yes. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and were you going to say something to make recommendations Did on you? donor selection criteria, on different processes, and so on? Uh, and the body—is uh, it right? The body that the um, uh, recommendations were made to was to the um, to JPAC. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yes. uh, and uh, to the joint joint United Kingdom. UK Blood Transfusion and Tissue Transpl Transplantation Services Professional Advisory Committee, known as JPAC. No. Yeah, that's right. Um, can we look at uh, a, a document just to um, uh, 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 help us understand how this committee worked? NHBT 40190 underscore 063. So this is a letter dated 14th December 1990 to Dr. Kalman, the Chief Medical Officer uh, at the Scottish Home and Health Department. And if we turn over to the second page, we can see that it's a letter from uh, d uh, Dr. Cash, National Medical and Scientific Director. Um, and it's actually um, page two of this that I want to draw your attention to. It says there, Harold Gunton has most positively responded to my suggestion that there should be established a UK BTS standing committee, which is responsible to the two directorates for maintaining appropriate specifications on the care and selection of donors. This committee is chaired by Dr Bill Wagstaff, and Dr Galea and myself are the SMBTS representatives. Uh, Dr Galea heads up a small SMBTS group which seeks to ensure that a collective SMBTS input is put into the UK BTS standing committee. The development should harmonise, should ensure harmonisation of content, but it cannot address the issue of the operational differences. Scotland will continue to be several months ahead in the implementation of change, and that uh, relates to um, uh, an issue he raises in, in the beginning of that letter. So, um, it, is it right to understand uh, then that the, their, the reference to the small uh, SMBTS group, which you head up, it is a reference to the donor uh, consultant uh, uh, group, uh, and, that, and that the, uh, as well as feeding um, information from that group into the um, MSC, you were also feeding information from that group into the Standing Advisory Committee on a donor care, uh, care and selection. That's right. Yep. Uh, 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 and. Uh, uh, and just a, a point on, on the dates here. We can see that this letter is dated December 1990. So clearly by December 1990, uh, this, the decision had been made for the Standing Advisory Committee to, um, uh, uh, to, to exist. Uh, but we, we know from the documentation that we have that the first meeting of that committee didn't take place until almost a year later. Do you know, it, it, the first meeting was in October 1991,
Do you know why there was uh, that delay? No, I really don't know. Um, maybe it was trying to find the appropriate members. Um, I'm not sure. It also was the beginning, I suspect, because there were a number of standing advisory committees that formed later, uh, which all fed into JPAC. Uh, whether that took some time for the English blood services to appoint people and so on, I'm not sure why there was no delay. Uh, and that standing advisory committee, uh, which I'm going, I'm going to refer to it as the standing advisory committee, but as you rightly point out, there were a number of standing advisory committees, but as I understand it, well, well it, 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 it's this standing advisory committee that I'm going to be asking you questions about primarily um, today. Um, so it, 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 this, the um, standing advisory committee was also concerned with, what well, was concerned with the production of donor exclusion material um, and revisions to donor material such as the AIDS leaflet, is that right? Yes, in some ways it wasn't fully responsible for it. I mean, the group made recommendations clearly. Um, the implementation and the leaflets and so on weren't part of the remit of the group, you know, how they looked, whether they were field tested or not, and that was an operational uh, matter. But when it came to the principles, yes, the SAC was the group that discussed these items, and then it depended very much on what the condition was. I mean, some things like the AIDS exclusion criteria went up to the highest levels to be agreed, you know, like AAGA and so on, um, and the uh, Scottish government and the, sorry, the UK governments to approve, um, whilst other issues which were, you know, whether somebody can be deferred if they've been to a malaria country, say, then they could be agreed at that group. So it depended on the scale of the matter and how serious the issue that was being discussed was. So some decisions, some recommendations could be made purely by the Standing Advisory Committee to JPAC. And if JPAC yes. accepted that recommendation, is it right that that would then be promulgated to the, uh, to the National Blood Transfusion Services, so in your case to the SNBTS, for the SNBTS to implement? Yes. And, and, and we formed the guidelines, the A, what we call the A to Z, you know, the alphabetical index of all the conditions. And that was updated on an annual basis. And, and therefore, we could use those then criteria for our routine deferral and acceptance of donors. And I'm, I'll, I'll be asking you some questions about, uh, about the A to Z guidelines uh, later on this morning. Um, and um, equally, uh, as you um, tell us, that there are some decisions or some recommendations that require the Standing Advisory Committee to consult with um, other organisations, such as the Expert Advisory Group on AIDS, for example, and then once um, their input had been received, or even perhaps a decision made by, by EGA, then a recommendation from the Standing Advisory Committee would go to JPAC, having carried out that, that exercise. Even sometimes, you know, over the years it changed, you know, many of these serious decisions were taken to SAPTO or MSBT as well um, for agreement. Um, also, for example, if, we, if there was a recommendation regarding testing, we used to consult with the SAC uh, on transfusion transmitted infections. So it was a pretty kind of uh, flexible way of getting the expertise from the most appropriate body. Uh, and the Standing Advisory Committee was also concerned with, 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 with drawing up what's colloquially called, um, as I understand it, the Red Book, or the guidelines for the blood transfusion service in the United Kingdom, or, or at least a chapter of that. Uh, yeah, not all, yes, the chapters which relate to donor care. Exactly, yeah. uh, and again, we'll look, at that, um, we'll look at that document in due course. Um, and then you were a member of a number of other advisory committees and working groups. Um, so you were a member and later chair of the United of the UK NIBSC BTS Standing Advisory Committee on Tissue and Stem Cells between 2001 and 2010. Uh, you were president of the British Association of Tissue Banking between 2003 and 2005. Is that right? Yes. Uh, you're chair of the British Association of Tissue Banking Medical Special Interest Group um, and vice president of that group. 
Yes. You were the, a member of SABTO between 2007 and 2014, is the, uh, bringing your expertise as a tissue banker to that group. Uh, and you were a member of the um, SACTTI, so the Standing Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Infections, SACTI, working group on VCJD, but you, and on the VCJD test subgroup, but you were not a member of SACTI itself, is that correct? That's right. Uh, 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 and uh, I think lastly, although um, it, you were also a member of the MSBT um, subgroup on, on bone as the chair. Yes, yes. That was a subgroup of MSBT or SAPTO as it became known afterwards um, in the early years when I began to input into the group when it came to bone and tissues. So, turning then to your time as a lecturer in haematology at Aberdeen University, w was that a purely academic post or did it involve clinical or laboratory work? Uh, it involved both as well. It involved lecturing, research, and also some uh, clinical work in the wards. Uh, and what clinical work were you um, undertaking at that stage? In uh, haematology. haematology. Uh, were you working with people with haemophilia? Uh, um, not really. Uh, most of the time uh, uh, in the ward it used to be with leukemic patients in the oncology wards. Were you at that time or towards the end of your time as a lecturer in haematology uh, teaching anything about AIDS and the, r the risks of AIDS uh, being transmitted by blood and blood products? When I was in haematology as far as I can recall, probably not. Um, I had a set number of lectures to give, you know, and they were agreed a year in advance kind of thing. Um, I don't recall giving lectures on AIDS at that, point, at that stage, no, I don't, I don't think so. Can you recall when you first knew or, that HIV or AIDS was, or, or HTLV3 uh, was a virus transmis transmitted by uh, blood? Well, it was big news um, in the early 80s, 82, 83, something like that. Um, so clearly, I was aware of it. Um, it was a topic of conversation in many conferences I attended. And uh, uh, clearly, when I joined the blood service uh, in Aberdeen, it was clearly a very hot topic then. It was well known, it was discussed, and so on. So, so it, probably it, was a, it, it was around that time. So, is this right, that you, you knew about it in, by the time you took up your post as senior registrar in Aberdeen in 1984, did you know by then that it was, uh, that, that HTLV3 was a virus transmissible by, by blood and blood products? Probably yes, I cannot swear, but probably yes, I, I, would, I would have thought, I would have known about it. Uh, and then in your, um, ca can you recall what you were teaching uh, when you were a lecturer in haematology? Can you recall what you were teaching about hepatitis? Uh, and in particular, what you were t t teaching about non-A, non-B hepatitis, or, or whether you were teaching about non-A, non-B hepatitis? No. My, my teaching was very much uh, into the leukemic field, because that's what I was doing. And also things like basic haematology, like iron deficiency anemia or megaloblastic anemia, um, infectious complications of transfusions. I wasn't part of the transfusion field then, so I wasn't teaching. I'm pretty sure I wasn't teaching it at the time. Were you aware at, at, at that time, can you recall, that um, hepatitis was transmissible by blood and blood products, or at least some forms of hepatitis, uh, and could be I mean, serious? In the case of hepatitis, it was a well-known act um, that hepatitis was transmitted by blood and that, you know, blood was tested for hepatitis B, uh, I think for syphilis as well at the time. Um, it was already being tested then. So clearly it was well known that hep hepatitis, that blood can be a vehicle for transmission of hepatitis B. Uh, um, hepatitis C was, was a different story. Uh, it wasn't part of the scene then as far as I can recall. I'm pretty sure it, it wasn't. Um, there was a condition known as non A non B hepatitis, um, which you know were 
jaundice was transmitted by blood and the hepatitis B antigen was negative. So it was known that there was this transmission taking place. Nobody knew what it was as such, um, but that, you know, it was happening, yeah, sure. Uh, and are you able to, to tell us when, when it was or whenabouts it was that you knew that non-A, non-B could cause serious liver disease? As I recall, probably when I was in the blood service, um, as a senior registrar, um, 89, 90, something like that. Um, probably, I mean, it was, it, I know that sometimes it used to be discussed in the labs, um, not so much about hepatitis C, but about this non non B hepatitis that was taking place. So it was a known condition, it wasn't like a mystery. Um, but at the time, you know, it was part of the 1,001 things that you're learning about transfusion medicine because, you know, it was, I was still in training then. Um, so, yes, of course, you learn about the complications of blood, about antigens, blood groups, and that it can transmit disease, sure. And like hepatitis B, non non B hepatitis, and so on, syphilis, malaria, and so on. I'm going to ask you some questions now about your time at Aberdeen, so between 1984 and 1993. Um, now, we have Dr. Obaniak coming to give evidence in January, so the questions I'm going to ask you are, are, are necessarily focused on, on what you were doing at the uh, transfusion centre rather than more, more generally what was happening. Um, first of all, can you tell us what your responsibilities were in your senior registrar post, so between 1984 and 1989? When you're in training within the blood service, at least in Aberdeen, I had no specific responsibilities as such. Um, it's a very hierarchical situation within the blood service, at least where I work. So the director was in charge of the centre. Uh, I was in training. Uh, I was doing... Um, I was revolving around different parts within the blood service and outside. So I think in the first two or three years, two years of my training, two or three, uh, I was spending four months in hematology, four months in infectious disease units, and four months at the blood center, doing a rotation to expose myself to um, transfusion matters. Then I did my MD, which was a postgraduate course, like a PhD. Um, which took me about 18 months, I believe. And then I was, my responsibilities as such, my, um, when I was in the blood service was to um, check all the blood groups of all new donors and all, and all, all patients, because we used to do antenatal work as well for pregnant women, um, advising on anti-D, for example, and who gets anti-D or not. Um, we used to share an on-call rota so because we were attached, we were part of, of Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. So we also were in the blood bank for the hospital. And therefore, if people required any advice on what components to give, whether somebody required platelets or somebody required FFP or a massive bleed or a postpartum hemorrhage, and then there always used to be a medical officer on call I used to be one of those. I think we were three or four, so it was a one in three rota, um, a 24 7 rota. I believe it was a week on, two weeks off basis, because although we used to be called at night, you know, many of the on call uh, dis discussions could take place over the phone. So you didn't have to come in very often. Um, sometimes we had to come in because we also used to do plasma exchanges on patients who were very ill, like with hemolytic uremic syndrome or uh, macroglobulinemia and so on. So we had to do recurrent plasma exchanges. And those, you had to come in, do them. You know, it used to be a procedure which would last, say, three, four hours on a machine in the wards with the patient. So rotations, on call, learning about and um, without any specific responsibilities for any part of the blood center itself. And were you, um, oh, sorry, did I, I interrupted you. That's okay, sorry, that's fine. Uh, and, and were you attending donor sessions during that period of your career? A few, because initially, you know, it was something which you, you do as part of your rotation. You learn how it's done. 
uh, and then you are, you know, you are an extra because you know all this, the donor sessions were all staffed appropriately. They, they did not depend on people in training because clearly, if I went away for four months in a ward, I wasn't available to be at sessions. So I went, I saw them, I learned about them, but I wasn't part of them as a routine. So you wouldn't have performed the role of a medical officer in a donor session while you were a senior registrar? No, or very, very rarely. However, I used to be available, apart when I used to be on call, uh, I used to be available for any, any queries. If sometimes a doctor or a nurse has a question in forest or in a village somewhere and they're not sure, there, there was always somebody in the center who could answer the question or try to answer the question or support the nurse or, or doctor and say, do not take or accept or defer, whatever. Um, so that was my limit of involvement there. And when you became a consultant in 1989, how did your, how did your role change? It changed quite a bit because then um, I do not think I remained on call as I used to be so frequently because there were people in training who were doing it, although I still participated, I think. Uh, but then I had more of donor interest areas. So I was in charge, although the, the, the director was always in charge, if you like, um, but my section was the donor section uh, where I was responsible for. So I would advise Stan Urbaniak about things about donors, like are we collecting enough or should we go to a different halls or should we organize things in a different way and so on and so forth. Did can you recall whether during um, that period in Aberdeen it, it was considered to be part of the duties either of yourself or of any of your other colleagues at the centre to educate uh, clinical colleagues in other hospitals uh, about, about transfusion medicine and, and in particular about the risks of, uh, 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 of blood and blood products? Absolutely. Um, we had the... the the advantage because we were part of the hospital. The blood center was based in the hospital itself. I mean, just, just outside of the Royal Infirmary was the blood center. So we were very close. And we also ran the blood bank for Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. We also did the cross matching. So we had very close relationships with the consultants and with the medical staff in the hospital itself. So for example, we, I remember uh, I was always interested in audits, and we ran a number of audits on the use, on the use of blood, for example, in obstetrics. Um, we used to identify that for a particular situation, for a cesarean section, for example, some consultants would order two points of blood, some would order six. We would say, you know, what is this? Why is this happening? So we used to audit them. And then o over the years, um, in Aberdeen, we established what are known as MISBOSES, Maximum Surgical Blood Ordering Schedules, so that with the consent of the clinicians or, and surgeons, we used to go and discuss with them and we say, look, for, for example, a gastrectomy, you only need two pints of blood and not more, unless there are complications. So we used to set these uh, schedules, which very often they agreed with, and these became the norm. So any operation that came in, uh, any request of blood that came in for the particular op uh, operation, the people in the blood bank would know how many units to cross match. And this brought down the use of blood quite a lot. Um, because as I say, there were surgeons who were much more uh, liberal in their usage. And with these kind of discussions and with these uh, schedules, um, we reduced the use of blood quite a bit. And we published on this. So because you know they were very very useful and because you then show people that nobody died because you only gave them two pints of blood nobody came into harm because you reduced blood usage and then with time all the consultants became much more confident and they became the norm and did you implement that system uh, that you've just described with the schedules of, of, of amounts of blood in in the centers you then became director of an in Inverness and Dundee Yes, yes. In actual fact, 
And I think these became quite national within Scotland. So when I went to, to Inverness, they were already in place. And what we did was I tweaked them, for example. And it's very difficult sometimes because different surgeons in different hospitals have different needs. And therefore, if, for example, in Aberdeen, for a hip replacement, you require two pints of blood. And then in fairness, it, it was three. Well, that wasn't too much of a, of a problem. So generally, we used to tweak them, uh, but not be so exact as to have throughout Scotland two pints of blood for every operation. Uh, um, what about education in terms of the risks, and in particular the, the, the risk of transfusion transmitted infection from blood and blood products? Did that form part of the conversation with your clinical colleagues? Yes, and I'm, I think many of the clinical colleagues knew, knew about the risks. I mean, they knew that um, blood could be uh, in, in infectious. I mean, HIV was very much you know, high on the agenda at the, at the time, uh, and hepatitis. So they didn't need much persuasion kind of thing. You know, they knew about the risks. Most of the teaching was in med to medical students. So medical students, um, I used to teach at the time. Um, and obviously, the risks of transfusion transmitted infections was, I used to hammer it down, you know, very important. I say it till today, you know, the safest blood is the blood that's not given. So, you know, be, be, be be conscious and give little, give as much as the patient requires, but don't go overboard and so on. So that kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it used to be part of my agenda to teach the medical students about that. And were there any formal um, uh, mechanisms for sharing this kind of information with the clinical colleagues rather than with, with students? Were there any meetings or a programme of lectures or, or anything of that nature? Yes. Um, we, I used to attend the various committees. So, for example, the athletics committee used to meet once a quarter or something like that, and probably once every alternate time, or, or maybe once, maybe once every six months, or every or once every nine months, I used to go back and show them their blood usage, show them you know how much they have cut down, and they used to like it because it used to be done in a non-threatening way. So it used to be like. When I used to go, if there were four obstetricians, I used to name them A, B, C, D, so that even they didn't know who they were when, when you're in the room, so that nobody feels threatened. And it wasn't like, why did you do this? But here is what, here is what you have used. Is there any way that we can cut this anymore? So it was done in a non-threatening way, in a collaborative way. And yeah, I mean, I think they were a big success in terms of required. Having said that, at the same time, there was the Better Blood Transfusion Initiative, which was taking place. So medical students were all being taught about this, how to give blood, um, how to cross-match people, what, what much better to give components than whole blood. In actual fact, the use of whole blood, um, I, I can remember very few instances, for example, when whole blood was used. because. The clinicians knew, and the, pe the young doctors in training all knew that component therapy was much more be was much better for patients than the blood that was whole blood. So they yes, with, um, with orthopedic surgeons, we did the same. So there were big groups which I used to attend and the committees and let them know about the blood usage and so on. Now you mentioned that um, in, in Aberdeen you were the the the. the, the, the transfusion center was also the blood bank for the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary uh, yes. and that was the case was it as well in in Inverness and Dundee yes I was very lucky in that respect because wherever I worked it was the blood bank as well so um, we used to do all, all the cross matchings we were on site in the main hospital and therefore you could build up liaisons with clinicians much more easily than if you were five miles away you know in a transfusion center uh, and so the, the role of the, of the transfusion centre was, was twofold, really. It was to, to, on the one hand, get the donations in, um, separate them into components where, where necessary, and store those components and supply those components to all of the um, hospitals in its area. 
um, as well as acting as, uh, and of course supply plasma to, to, um, for fractionation, um, as well as acting as a, a, a blood bank. Yes, yes. That changed around 97, I think, when the processing and testing sites changed within SMBTS, and they became located in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. So the peripheral, if you like, blood banks lost their processing ability. So then all the blood that was collected went to the processing sites. And in, in our case, it used to be in Edinburgh. All the blood was processed there, and then we got back the components, you know, the platelets, the plasma, and the red cells. And that was when you were in Dundee? Yes, correct. And I'll ask you a, 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 few, a few more questions about that in, in due course. So is it right um, to understand then in terms of the records that you had access to for those hospitals that way, where you blood banked, whether it's Aberdeen, Inverness or Dundee, that you would have had access to patient records in those hospitals but not in the other hospitals? Patient transfusion records, yeah? not, not the full hospital records, but that, yes, we had access to that transfusion records, yeah. Uh, and so when it comes to look back, trying to identify what's happened to particular um, uh, components of blood or particular packs of blood, was it very much easier in the, for, those, for those patients? I suspect it was, um, because we had records, I mean, within SMBTS, I don't think we ever threw a paper out. You know, we keep everything. Everything was kept. Even though we became computerized, I think even paper records were kept. So it was, I think, relatively easier to trace patients when, because we had all the records ourselves. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, when we did the look back, um, the, those hospitals, those centers, which also ran the blood banks like where I was, we, we our, our finding of patients was much easier than if you were, for example, in Glasgow, where in Glasgow, they weren't part of a hospital, they didn't keep patient records, and therefore it was much more difficult because you were dependent then on the blood bank, on a different consultant, a different set of people, you know, a different blood bank. So I think it was relatively easier for us to be more, to, and probably, although I'm not sure, maybe a bit more comprehensive as well because we kept records forever. Although that, that, that's the case only for the, for the for the hospitals that you were the blood bank for. There were other hospitals yeah. on your patch in... Um, in uh, Aberdeen, th that wouldn't have, um, uh, that wasn't well, the case. Uh, um, there were hospitals like, you know, in the islands, in Shetland and in Orkney, where, you know, they were, we used to supply them with blood, but they kept all the records themselves. And similarly, with uh, Dundee and Inverness, there were other hospitals which we didn't run the blood bank. We were attached to the main teaching hospital, if you like, um, but other general hospitals, we supply them with that blood and with the platelets, but nothing else. Uh, and you'd say in, in your statement and, uh, that, that the efforts were made to improve the flow of information from hospital blood banks back to the transfusion centre. Uh, can can yes, you recall yes. what, 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 what efforts were made uh, and, and what was effective and what wasn't? We used to insist, for example, um, if I can re remember correctly now, because it's a long time ago, that if a, if, a if a bag of blood was sent out for a patient, we used to send out sheets with the patient's name on, and then we used to insist, or try to insist, that that sheet comes back to us with the patient's name, so that we know that that unit has been transfused. Now. Initially, you know, I remember it used to be quite patchy, like we used to get something like, I'm guessing here, but around 70%, say, of the paper was used to come back. So we used to have, like, when I used to go to, to speak with the consultants, I used to make, I used to tell them, please, in your words, make sure that, you know, you encourage all the nurses and all the junior doctors to give you all the papers back. And because also the, there were times, and this I don't think, you know, you can change, where you send out a unit of blood, it doesn't come back, and then you assume that it has been transfused. Now, sometimes it would have been discarded in the ward, 
maybe, you know, maybe the patient didn't need it, it was out of spec, it was out of the fridge and so on, so then it was discarded in the ward. So we wouldn't get, we could never get all the paperwork back. But it definitely improved in my time. And the last time I was involved in this was before I became a tissue services director. So I think more, more efforts have been, have been made since then to make sure that all the paperwork or as, as many come back so that one can reconcile exactly that the patient has got the blood or otherwise. Uh, and then just um, looking at the, the donor sessions held while you were I in Aberdeen, is it right to understand that they took place all over the um, Aberdeen area, including in Shetland and Orkney? Shetland and Orkney? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think Shetland and Orkney we ever had a blood session there. But um, throughout the region, yes, in village halls, sometimes in workplaces, um, sometimes if it was a small village, for example, and there was an inappropriate hall, we used to send what is called a blood mobile. So it's a, a big truck with its back. In, in the back of it, there were, it was compartmentalized into two or three uh, different sections. So a donor would go in, it has his hemoglobin tested, as this medical screening done, and then bled in the van itself. So yes, in many places, workplaces, village halls, and sometimes uh, in this blood mobile. Plus also, we obviously had sessions in the blood center itself in Aberdeen. We had a static um, donation center. And what, what, was there um, plasmapheresis in Aberdeen while you were there? Yes, yes. Um, uh, it was always machine, plasmapheresis. Um, I can't recall exactly whether it was in Aberdeen or in Dundee, but we also collected platelets sometimes by apheresis machines. Um, yes, but we did, yeah. Um, and do you recall whether or not there were any sessions held in prisons during your time in Aberdeen, in particular during your early years in Aberdeen? I can't recall. I don't think so. Um, somehow, it, it might be better if Stanor Benny can give you an answer on that one. But I do not think we did. Um, nor did we get, um, did we take blood in prisons in in Venice or in Dundee, as I recall. I don't think so. And do you recall whether you um, took had, had any blood um, uh, had any donation sessions with members of the military? May, uh, good question. Maybe in Inverness, but there was a big centre in Kinloss. Um, I suspect we did. Although I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I suspect we did. Um, partly because my predecessor was a military man as well, Bill Whitrow, uh, and maybe he had links with them. So I think we probably did um, from military personnel from Kinloss, RAF Kinloss, it used to be. It, it maybe still is. And do you know whether there was any conversation or any discussion about whether or not those donors may pose a higher risk of transfusion transmitted infections or whether that was something that you thought you should consider or look into? Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware we had any, any discussion uh, specific about it. I know that within in some forum, whether it was MSC or there was a discussion about prisons. There was a debate about prisons somewhere. I can't remember the exact forum where it was and whether people should go and keep on collecting from prisons or not. Uh, I think there was a, a, a mixed view. Some people said that prisons are high risk areas, if you like. Others said the risk is of drug use and therefore if you exclude people who are drug users, then you can still go to prisons. But because in Dundee and in, and, and in Venice prisons wasn't an issue for me, then I didn't give it much attention because it, it wasn't an issue for me. Military, I don't, I'm not aware of. I was going to ask you a handful of questions about um, HIV while, while you were at um, Aberdeen. Um, so you arrived uh, there just prior to HIV testing being introduced. Did you have any role in the decision as to when HIV testing should be introduced in Aberdeen? No, absolutely not, no. 
Uh, did you have a any role in the decision-making as to what needed to be in place before it was introduced I in Aberdeen? I had, no, I had no role in decision making when I was in training at all. Um, it was a very hierarchical situation. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's bad, it's, it's how it was. And therefore, particularly because I was so new, um, it was just some learning and I was being told that, you know, we're going to start testing and so on and so forth. Um, so at, at, the, at the time, I just took everything at face value. Uh, I know that uh, um, at some point, and I'm trying to think when, whether it was when I was a consultant or before, I was sent to a course um, on counseling donors who were HIV positive uh, and to learn about how HIV is transmitted amongst particularly gay men and so on. Um, so, and I did do some counseling in Aberdeen um, for HIV positive donors. Yeah, I did. But, you know, when it was introduced and what issues had to be done before in Aberdeen, no, I, I had no say. So, so those questions will be best directed to Dr. Abaniak next year? It would be much better, yeah, brief on that. And you anticipated my next question, which was about the HIV counselling uh, or the HIV course. Was that the, the counselling training that, that was delivered at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, London? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and were you the only attendee from the Aberdeen Centre? Yes, as far as I know, yes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, did, did that mean that you effectively took the lead on HIV donor counselling when you returned back to Aberdeen? It was probably a shared responsibility between me and Dr. Uh, Urbaniak, but probably I did most of them, yes. I mean, in Aberdeen, I'm trying to think, we didn't have many HIV positives, but maybe I'm, I'm guessing here, but I don't, I don't know, five, six people perhaps, something like that of that order. And I would have done quite a few of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to turn just to t turn up and just have a, a, a brief look at the AIDS leaflets that were in use during your, your time. So the first one, uh, I believe, is PRSE, Three zeros, three zero zero three. So we can see here a document called AIDS, new information for all blood donors. <coughs> um, and um, Uh, we can see uh, top primary concern is for your safety. Second paragraph, we want you to know we are about to introduce an important new addition to our donor health screening program. All donations will be tested to see whether they have been in contact with the HTLV3 virus, which may cause AIDS. So it's right, is it right to understand that this was the leaflet that came in uh, uh, into use just uh, before HTLV3 screening was introduced? It must be. I think, however, there were also leaflets sent out before when there was no test being done. Um, there were leaflets which um, specified the high-risk people, so that, you know, like gay men or uh, intravenous drug users and so on, um, not to come and give blood, because we were very scared that people would come and give blood because they wanted to find out uh, whether they were positive or not. So I think even before the test came out, these things were issued. Yes, I, I, I think my question was a little bit unclear. I wasn't suggesting this was the first HDLV or first AIDS Sorry. leaflet sent out by SMBTS, but it, it just it, 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 in terms of the chronology, you arriving in 1984 and this then being the first sort of revi or the first revision during your time there. It, it um, must be. I mean, I can't remember the details, but it must be, yeah. And then um, it, it says at the bottom of that, please remember... Um, it's essential, although we are introducing the HDLV3 th testing, you must not volunteer to be a blood donation, don't, to give a blood donation if you are or have been a practicing homosexual or bisexual man, a drug user, either man or woman who injects drugs, resident in a visitor, a resident in or a visitor to Central African countries, a sexual partner of people in these groups. 
Um, and then uh, there's reference there to being asked to sign a health check form, which will include the statement that um, you have read and understood the importance of, the, of this message. Um, and, um, and then making the point, if you don't wish your blood to be tested, don't give blood. Um, and then if we turn um, then in, can you recall how this uh, leaflet was provided to donors? Was it sent with call-up cards? Was it given yes, during sessions? Um, it was definitely freely available at sessions, at, ev at every session. Uh, if I remember, if I remember correctly, it was even sent to all blood donors before when they were called up. Um, and maybe, although I'm not sure, maybe even to all GPs. Um, it was definitely very widespread. Um, we, we wanted to make sure for the safety of the blood that uh, because one, it was, there was always a risk of a window period transmission because at the time we were only testing for the antibody and we wanted to make sure therefore that um, the development criteria as, as listed were, well, were very well known to everybody because we didn't want them to come and, and be tested just to find out. And then uh, 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 I, I believe there was a very wide exposure to this leaflet. <coughs> and then um, if we move then to uh, um, this document, PRSE 302158. Um, AIDS, an important message for blood donors. And if we look at the bottom of that document, we can see revision 5, May 1987. Um, uh, and... Uh, we can see um, uh, that the AIDS, people who, who must not give blood, the criteria there, uh, halfway down the page, anyone who has AIDS or the AIDS antibody, any man who has had sex with another man since 1977, so that's changed from practicing homosexuals uh, to uh, any man who's had sex with another man since 1977, anyone who has ever injected themselves with drugs, anyone who has li li lived in or visited Africa, south of the Sahara at any time since 1977 and has had sex with men or, or women living there, anyone who has had regular treatment with blood products since 1977, any man or woman who has been a prostitute at any time since 1977, anyone who has had, uh, ever had sex with a person in the above groups, even on a single occasion. Now, did you have any role um, re recalling that this is from May 1987, did you have any role in drafting that uh, leaflet? No, it was before my time, for sure. Uh, having said that, I, I um, the the exclusion criteria over time have um, changed um, quite a bit. Uh, every revision changed to look at the, the current epidemiology at the time, the risk factors at the time. So. You know, there were, uh, although the main groups remain the same, that there were quite a few changes over, over, over the years. But I think there were two or three major revisions, but, in the, but otherwise, there were also other changes. For example, the 1977 date was dropped. So, like, for example, have you ever been a homosexual or practiced? Because we wanted to move away from just being a homosexual too, the actual risky practice. Um, some countries that were included in some of the leaflets initially, like Haiti and Chad and Zaire, I think, uh, were dropped because the epidemiology didn't um, substantiate them to be in the, in the categories. So we stuck for uh, with Sub-Saharan Africa throughout the whole time, practically, because the epidemiology stated that you know, the, it was very endemic in those regions. Um, there was a question uh, where, for example, it, it, it was changed to anybody who has had sex in Africa of any race, because initially people had thought that we were uh, earmarking blacks or, or that we were being uh, in some way uh, uh, racial, whilst we were not. So there were these tweaks to look at the uh, uh, at current epidemiology at the, at the time. Some of the temporary exclusions 
um, changed from two years to one year because obviously the tests became better, became more sensitive. So it was felt that you know a one year was a very good safety margin for picking up the antibody. So two or three big revisions, but in the meantime there were also these kind of <coughs> tweak, if you like, always, as far as I know, approved at the highest levels. Can we look now then, please, at MACK 301160. So in, in, oh, we'll just wait until the document comes up. We can see that this is a letter dated 16th of November 1990 to Professor Cash, and it's from uh, you. We don't need to turn over, but it's from um, you. Um, uh, um, and uh, you say at, at the bottom uh, of the, uh, that page, uh, Mari Thornton has passed on to me the English AIDS leaflet telling me that you would like ours to be the same. So d can, you recall, uh, can you recall then that, that there was a drive in, certainly from Professor Cash, that there should be uh, parity in, in, in leaflets between um, England and Scotland in 1990. Definitely. And I, and I would say, you know, there was a drive to have as much commonality as possible. And this drive became bigger, if you like. So it wasn't just in the leaflet. But in this case, definitely there was a push. Um, but from my, you know, my working life within SMBTS, I've always worked to make sure that as far as possible there was harmonization and commonality between the UK blood services, not just you know, the UK blood services. And so you then say, I, I have gone over um, our current Scottish leaflets and the English ones uh, to look for major differences, and I have taken the opportunity now that I do have quite a number of AIDS deferral leaflets from other countries to look at what other countries have. I shall try and discuss them step by step, itemising them as per the Scottish leaflet. Uh, and um, uh, it's the Scottish leaflet that we've just been looking at that you were comparing with the English leaflet. Just for the transcript, I don't think we need to go to it, but the English leaflet that you were looking at is at PRSE 00002158. And then you go over and you, um, you go through the various different categories. So anyone who has, has AIDS or the AIDS antibody is the first category. And then over the page, any man who has had sex with... Oh, sorry, back to page two. Any man who has had sex with another man since 1977, you note that you're in agreement there um, with England. Anyone who has ever injected themselves with drugs, um, and you note that there's a departure there between England and Scotland. Um, anyone who has lived or visited Africa uh, south of the Sahara at any time since 1977 and has had sex with men or women living there. Um, and you say, note that that's practically identical with the exception of, 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 of uh, changing um, the sub-Saharan Africa to African countries, except those on the Mediterranean. Uh, and then over the page, uh, anyone who has had regular treatments with blood products since 1977 and you note that the English AIDS leaflet doesn't mention that at all. Um, and then um, any man or woman who has been a prostitute at any time since 1977. Uh, and you um, note again that there is a difference um, between uh, Scotland and England in relation to that criteria. Uh, and then uh, number seven, commonality um, in the criteria about having had sex with a, a person in that group. Um, and then you um, conclude uh, by saying at, at the last paragraph there, I find that our guidelines are better when it comes to excluding donors who are regularly on blood, blood products. The English version only excludes sexual partners of haemophiliacs. What about far, partners with um, von Willebrand's disease who receive factor eight? And then you, we don't need to go to it, but you include a, a table of the summary of your uh, findings on the difference. Um, is it right to understand that, that the work that you did here was, it was and, and remembering that this is in November 1990, and we looked at that letter from Professor Cash in December 1990, in which he 
sets out that the Standing Advisory Committee on Donor Care and Selection had been agreed at that stage. Is it right to understand that this work that you started here in terms of commonality between England and Scotland was in fact picked up by that Standing Advisory Committee and, um, and, and, and dealt with in, in that forum? I suspect that's exactly what happened, although I can't recall the specifics, but it would be the kind of work where I would have, which I would have done and then given it to the SAC and says, these are the big differences, the main differences, sorry, and probably there would have been a discussion as to whether things needed changing or whether the interpretation was all right. So, yeah, that would be the exact forum that I would have taken it to. Uh, and do, do you, perhaps I can put it another way, do you recall whether between November 1990 when you wrote this letter and that first meeting in October 1991 of the Standing Advisory Committee, you doing any work on the Scottish AIDS leaflet to um, bring it in line with the English leaflet and issue it? I, I, no, I don't think, that, I, don't think I, I would have. Um, having noticed the differences and having, the, and, and having done, if you like, an international uh, uh, survey looking at what other countries were, were doing, I would have sent it to, to John Cash and then I think that would have been discussed at the SAC. I don't think I would have done anything myself to modify it or change it. I didn't feel I had the authority to do that in, in any case. Um, now I'm going to ask you uh, some questions about, again, you've, bearing in mind that you, you've told us you weren't involved in any, any real decision making in Aberdeen. I'm, I'm just going to run through a list of questions with you just to, to um, uh, confer or to, to check the position with you. Were you involved while at Aberdeen, e even as a consultant, with decisions made about targets for blood collection and the amounts of plasmas to be sent to PFC for fractionation? Not really, no. I mean, clearly, there would have been discussions, you know, like if, we, if the targets were increased, I would have been asked, for example, you know, can we achieve these extra bits or these extra kilos of plasma? And probably I would have given my input. But the decision whether to accept those targets or not would have been the director's one. Uh, and were you involved with the decision about whether or not to introduce surrogate testing for non-A, non-B while you were in Aberdeen? No. D do you recall discussions taking place about whether or not that should be introduced? There was discussion. I can't remember the year, whether it was in Aberdeen or a bit later. Um, Yes, there was discussion about whether um, surrogate testing, anti-core or ALT testing should be done. And I think, you know, there were people who, who had very different views. It was discussed at, um, in a number of fora, uh, definitely in Aberdeen or, or in Inverness. I mean, I, I do remember having these discussions with, with colleagues. I can't remember the exact place, but yes, I was very aware that one could do surrogate testing if one wanted, yeah. Uh, and was surrogate testing introduced in Aberdeen dur during your tenure there? From my knowledge, no. Were you involved in any of the decision making around when to introduce hepatitis C testing while you were in Aberdeen? No. Um, my understanding is that that was a national decision. Um, so I don't think it is. Uh, maybe I'm talking out of term, but I don't think it was even Orbanyak's decision. It was a national decision when to go, a start date. Probably even it was a UK-wide decision. So those questions are best directed to Dr. Orbanyak next, next year? I think he'll be able to give you more of a, of a background to that, yeah. Um, I just got one question, I think, to ask you uh, about hepatitis C screening in Aberdeen. Um, you were asked a question in, in the Rule 9 about whether or not, um, uh, about screening, and you, you say that you, 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 you said that you believe that all stock was screened at the start of testing. And I just wanted to explore that with you a, a, a little. What, one, of the, one of the matters the inquiry is interested in is whether um, blood collected prior to screening being implemented and uh, having been collected and um, split into its various components and perhaps um, uh, frozen 
red cell concentrate or fresh frozen plasma or, or, or a, 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 a product with a long shelf life, whether that, those, that those products would have been issued from the centre post-screening, unscreened. Are you able to help us with that? I, I think... Um... I think that all this all this stock would have been screened. So if there's plasma, remember we always kept archive samples, small archive samples. And therefore, if it is something that has been stored for a long time, it would probably be even easier to issue it screened because you have time. So I think that all this stock, or the vast majority of it, would have been tested on the day when testing was started in October or September 1991. Um, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Um, I'm pretty, uh, I can't be 100% sure, but I, I'm 99% sure I would have thought that all this stock would have been sc um, screened and, and tested. Uh, and and even those that have been stored for a long time, like you know, rare blood cells, for example, frozen blood, that, would, that, that isn't going to be issued in a hurry, then you have even more time to screen it. So that definitely would be screened. And do you recall what happened to the components, products, blood that was in, already in circulation in blood banks in other hospitals? Do you recall whether or not untested product was recalled and replaced? Or do you think that that would have been used and... I, I, so, could have been so untested product could have been used after screening was introduced. I cannot remember uh, specifically, but knowing how SMBTS works, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't, because you know, I, you know, when it came to blood safety, I think we were pretty um, careful and thorough to make sure that you know we were as tight as possible when it comes to blood safety. So, although I can't remember. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Um, I, 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 would, I would have thought all, all the blood and products would have been tested on the day. I, I'm, um, sir, going to move on to look at some of the work that Dr. Galea did uh, in his role as medical advisor to the blood collection programme. Uh, and I note that it's quarter past 11 in our, ta our time. I wonder if now is an appropriate time for a break. Uh, yes. Well, we'll take a, a break until quarter to 12 our time. I think it may, may be quarter to one uh, your time. Uh, okay. But um, I, I, I'm right, am I, about, about your time? That's all right, no problem at all. That's fine, yeah? You are right. It's now quarter past 12, yeah. Thank you. Um, and during your, the, the break, what I say to all witnesses at this stage is they must not discuss the evidence they have given or any evidence they think they are yet likely to be asked to give with anyone, whoever that person is, um, but you, you can talk about anything else you like. Okay, I will surely do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quarter to twelve.